These days, the cinematic landscape of blockbuster movies has become utterly dominated by the superhero genre. On the big screen, Marvel's interconnected universe of films is the most successful movie franchise ever made, and DC's looser connected standalone efforts continue to take bold creative risks with their characters. But it's arguable this era of superhero dominance never would have happened if not for a film released way back in 1978. Clark Kent, aka Superman, made his debut in 1938 in Action Comics No. 1. The character was truly the first of his kind. While mythology was already replete with superhumans and comic books were already filled with pulp heroes, Jerry Siegel and Joe Shuster's creation was the first true superhero. The character was an instant smash hit, eventually getting his own dedicated solo comic the following year. It wasn't long before the character leapt off the page and into other mediums such as the radio show The Adventures of Superman, which invented Kryptonite, the Fleischer Superman cartoons, which invented his flying ability, as well as the Kirk Allen and George Reeves live-action serials and TV show. Thanks to Superman's success in these forms, and his and other superheroes playing a part in World War II morale boosting, the character had gone from a comic book power fantasy to an American cultural icon. Despite this pop cultural status, however, few saw potential in a big screen, big budget Superman feature film. One who did, though, was Ilya Sulkind. Ilya's father, Alexander Sulkind, was a seasoned movie mogul at this point in time. The Sulkinds had found great success producing historical epics like The Daughter of the Regiment, Austerlitz, and Cervantes, drama films like Orson Welles' The Trial, as well as adventure films like The Light at the Edge of the World, The Three Musketeers, and its sequel, The Four Musketeers. Alexander Sulkine had little knowledge or interest in Superman, and in truth his son Ilya had only a general familiarity with the character. However, Ilya saw great potential in bringing Superman to the big screen. He pitched to his father the idea of bringing the scope of the lavish European epics they had already produced to a cultural icon like Superman, and Alexander Sulkine agreed the picture could be a huge hit. Warner Brothers, however, who had already bought DC Comics by this point, didn't agree, and in 1974 a long and intensive round of negotiations began for the Sulkines to acquire the film rights for the character. Part of negotiations was DC's demand to see a full list of potential actors who the Sulkines were considering for the lead role. This list included Muhammad Ali, Al Pacino, Dustin Hoffman, James Caan, Steve McQueen, and Clint Eastwood, among many others. Eventually, the Sulkines were successful in securing the rights in a negative pickup deal. However, due to the expected expense of the production and the arduous process of securing the rights, the Sulkines decided to shoot not one but two Superman movies back to back. To write the film, Ilya Sulkind initially hired acclaimed science fiction author Alfred Bester. However, he only got as far as a rough treatment before Alexander Sulkind demanded they hire a superstar writer to lend the production some legitimacy. Thus, the producers hired Godfather screenwriter Mario Puzo. While Puzo began work on the script, the Sulkines went in search of a director to helm the project. Among those considered were Francis Ford Coppola, William Friedkin, Sam Peckinpah, and George Lucas. Negotiations either fell through or the directors were committed elsewhere, such as George Lucas's commitments to Star Wars. Ilya Sulkind championed Steven Spielberg, and his father was convinced following the release of Jaws but he too was committed to other projects like Close Encounters of the Third Kind. Eventually, the producers succeeded in hiring Guy Hamilton, famous for directing a number of James Bond movies. Hamilton was hugely enthusiastic about the project and began filming test footage for the elaborate special and visual effects. Meanwhile, the Salkinds had started casting the film, and as with the writer and director, the producers wanted some big names to lend the production further legitimacy. At the time, Marlon Brando was one of the biggest movie stars on the planet, and the Sulkines believed if they could land an actor of his power, then other stars would be lining up to join the project. Negotiations with Brando to play Superman's father Jor-El were difficult and demanding, with the actor eventually securing a $3.7 million salary, as well as a cut of the box office as well. This was an astronomically high payday at the time, for what would be an incredibly short amount of screen time. But with Brando on board, the production ran into some difficulties. 
The Solkines had originally planned to shoot the film in Italy at the famous Cinecitta Studios in Rome. However, Brando couldn't shoot in Italy as he was wanted on an obscenity charge following the release of Last Tango in Paris. Therefore, the production was relocated to England at Pinewood Studios. This meant losing Guy Hamilton as director though, as he was wanted for tax evasion and so had to drop out. Mark Robson, known for directing the disaster movie Earthquake, was briefly considered as a replacement, but eventually the producers became interested in director Richard Donner, following his helming of the hit horror film The Omen. I was on the job and the phone rings and this funny little voice says, this is Alexander Salkine, you know who I am? I said, no. He said, what do you mean you don't know who I am? I said, no, I don't know who you are. What are you selling? He said, I'm not selling anything. I'm a very famous producer. I said, good, congratulations. What, this is Sunday. What do you want? He said, we're making the movie Superman, and I wonder if you want to direct it. He said, I'll give you a million dollars. I said, well, give me some information. And I'd written it down on a little tiny card that was in the bathroom. It was a hairdresser's card, this girl that came to your house to cut hair. And I wrote down on the back of it, million dollars, which I don't even think I got enough zeros in. And I wrote Gene Hackman, Marlon Brando, the dates they were available, and Superman. That card today is still, it's the most important card of my life. Donner, unlike Hamilton, was a huge Superman fan, having read many of the comics as a child. He was happy to accept the gargantuan task of directing both movies, but first he had to make a few changes. First of which was retooling Mario Puzo's script, which was over 550 pages long. Donner recalled, They had prepared the picture for a year and not one bit was useful to me. You can't shoot this screenplay because you'll be shooting for five years. That was literally a shooting script and they planned to shoot all 500 pages. You know, 110 pages is plenty for a script, so even for two features, that was way too much. Donner brought on Tom Mankiewicz to rewrite the script from scratch. However, due to the Writers Guild of America's regulations, Donner could only credit Mankiewicz as a creative consultant. Among other things, Mankiewicz was the one who conceived of the idea of Krypton having noble houses, symbolised by a unique crest, with Superman's famous S being the crest for the House of L, and so on. Donner also hired production designer John Barry, cinematographer Jeffrey Unsworth, and editor Stuart Baird, as well as many in the special and visual effects teams. Donner's mandate for all the department heads was verisimilitude, meaning the appearance of being true or real. Their goal was to make the fantastical world of Superman feel as believable to the audience as possible. Donner's efforts in energising the production crew also helped him handle the cast. As the start of shooting approached, Marlon Brando, in a meeting with Donner and Ilya Sulkind, famously suggested playing Jor-El as either a talking green suitcase or a bagel. He said, I, uh, I thought maybe I should play it like a... I'm witty, green suitcase? He says, a bagel. I said, I beg your pardon? He said, like a bagel. I said, I, uh, it's different. What do, you, what, do you, what do you mean? He said, well, who's to say what Krypton's like? Who's to say what, maybe the people look like bagels up there. But I'm smart enough to know what humans look like, so I make my child in the form of a human so I can send him to Earth, but I'll be a bagel. I mean, I said, this is it. I mean, I'm, I'm gone and I'm going to go in Brazil and hide. The film will blow. This is it. This man is completely nuts. I was completely petrified. I said, you know, Marlon, there isn't a kid from six to my age that doesn't know what your old looks like. He said, what do you mean? I said, the comic book's around since 39. He says, I talk too much, don't I? I said, well, you could go on. He said, but I talked myself into what you're here for. I said, kind of. He said, okay, show me what I look like. I showed him, and from there on in, he was a doll. Paul Newman was offered the role of Lex Luthor and Superman, but turned both down. After Marlon Brando was on board, however, Gene Hackman pursued the villainous role. With hits like The Poseidon Adventure, The Conversation, and A Bridge Too Far under his belt, Hackman had exactly the kind of star power the Solkinds were looking for, and so he was cast as Lex Luthor. With two big names on board, production was ramping up, but the film was still yet to find its lead. Ilya Salkine's wife had gone to the dentist the day before, and while she was sitting there having her teeth repaired, she looked up <laughs> into the eyes of the dentist and said, 
my God, it's Clark Kent. I mean, this is how bizarre and how extreme and how desperate we were to find Superman. He tested for the part. It's all over, Luther. You're coming with me. We were looking in every corner of the earth for another candidate to play Superman. The Solkinds continued to favor American movie stars like Robert Redford and Paul Newman. However, casting director Lynn Stallmaster soon came to Donner and the Solkinds with the name of a 24-year-old Christopher Reeve. Christopher Reeve, a graduate of the renowned Juilliard Acting School, had just started to break into screen acting in the mid-1970s, having landed a role in the soap opera Love of Life and later a bit part in the naval submarine thriller Grey Lady Down. However, his most acclaimed work was on Broadway, in plays like A Matter of Gravity, where he became close friends with the legendary Catherine Hepburn. It was while acting the play My Life with William Hurt that he was told he was being considered for Superman. Stallmaster had put Reeves' picture in front of Donner and the Sulkines three separate times, and each time they moved him to the bottom of the pile for being too unknown and too skinny. But over time, Stallmaster was able to convince them to give Reeve a shot at a screen test. He hopped off the balcony and said, Good evening, Miss Lane. And Jeffrey Unsworth looked over at me and went, Because the tone was just right. The thing, he went through the test and we knew we had him. Good evening, Miss Lane. Careful, you'll... Okay, so you won't. Thank you very much for finding the time for this interview. I realize there must be many questions about who the world would like to know the answers to. Instantly, the team was convinced Reeve was the perfect man for the job, and with Warner Brothers' approval, he was cast as Superman. Reeve's approach for the Clark Kent side of the character was largely inspired by Cary Grant's performance in Bringing a Baby, only more bumbling and with an added stutter. For his performance as Superman, he essentially let the costume do the work and underplayed the character, eschewing the need to puff his chest or pose dramatically. He recalled, By the late 1970s, the masculine image had changed. Now it was acceptable for a man to show gentleness and vulnerability. I felt that the new Superman ought to reflect that contemporary male image. To get in shape for the role, the producers hired David Prowse, the famous bodybuilder who played Darth Vader in the original Star Wars, to train Reeve for the role. To play the young Clark Kent in Smallville, the producers cast Jeff East, albeit in heavy prosthetic makeup to closer resemble Christopher Reeve. Initially, East used his real voice in the scenes, but was later dubbed over by Reeve without his knowledge. This was something which apparently greatly upset the actor at the time. Among those considered for the crucial role of Lois Lane were Leslie Ann Warren and Anne Archer, who both screen-tested with Christopher Reeve. But it was Margot Kidder who immediately won over Richard Donner. So this girl came in, and, I mean, she didn't walk in the door, she tripped in. Margot is a klutz, a born accident waiting to happen. I remember being quite nervous, looking over at Superman, who was the skinniest dorkiest thing I'd ever seen and going, that's Superman? This is something's wrong with this picture. <laughs> it was quite a project with Margot, but her charm shined through and made her very lovable, very adorable. And audiences really responded, I think. To fill out the other roles of the Daily Planet were Mark McClure, known for Freaky Friday and I Wanna Hold Your Hand, and the legendary Jackie Cooper as Perry White, who was a last minute replacement in the role after the original actor Keenan Wynn suffered a heart attack. Completing Lex Luthor's gang of criminals were Ned Beatty as Otis and Valerie Perrine as Miss Teschmacher. Meanwhile, Glenn Ford was cast as Jonathan Kent and Phyllis Thaxter was cast as Martha Kent, though in the film they are only credited simply as Pa and Ma Kent. Back on Krypton, Susanna York was cast as Superman's mother, Lara L, though only credited as Lara. To play the evil Kryptonian insurrectionists, Terence Stamp was cast as General Zod, Sarah Douglas as Ursa, and Jack O'Halloran as Non. With the cast finally in place, studio and location secure, and a promising start to the special effects work, filming began on the 28th of March, 1977. The scope of principal photography was enormous. Shooting the two movies back to back, would eventually take 19 months, and 11 units shooting simultaneously across three continents with over a thousand crew members. 
It's no surprise then that Superman became the most expensive film production in movie history at the time. Filming began at Pinewood Studios, where the Fortress of Solitude and related Krypton sets were built at the famous 007 soundstage and even spilled over into Shepperton Studios. Production designer John Barry researched the Superman comics and found a preoccupation with the crystal motif related to the famous varieties of kryptonite. He suggested to Donner this crystal motif be expanded to all Krypton-related settings, making the fortress and the interiors on Krypton all resemble the inside of crystals. Donner loved the idea, which also inspired costume designer Yvonne Blake to create something which would give the Kryptonians an almost angelic quality. She sourced a material from the company 3M, which built cinema screens. It was a highly reflective material made out of thousands upon thousands of minuscule glass balls. After the costume department spent weeks sewing these glass balls into the costumes, they would be lit by bouncing a white light onto them, creating a bright glowing effect. While filming the Krypton scenes, Marlon Brando was famously lazy, refusing to learn lines and instead reading them off cue cards and even off baby Superman's nappy. He even admitted to not having actually read the full script. On the first day, I came onto the set, and then he said, uh, have, you, have you read this? I said, yeah. Hmm. I said, haven't you read it, Marlon? No, I haven't, I haven't read it. I said, Marlon, why haven't you read it? Well, you know, it might be real crap, and uh, I need the money, you know, so I haven't read it. <laughs> Though apparently after he did read it, Brando was immensely supportive of the film, using every opportunity to sing its praises to the press. For the Metropolis scenes, the production moved to New York City, where the New York Daily News building stood in for the Daily Planet. During filming, the city suffered a major blackout, and cinematographer Jeffrey Unsworth joked that it must have been his fault due to the amount of lighting equipment he had plugged in at the time. The production also moved up to Alberta, Canada, which stood in for all of the Smallville scenes. Warner Brothers was very encouraged by the footage they were seeing of the film and expanded their distribution arrangement to include all foreign distribution rather than just North America. They also gave the production an extra $20 million when costs ran over budget in exchange for the television rights. While Warner Brothers was extremely excited by the film, the reality of the shoot was much more contentious. Richard Donner clashed harshly with the Solkinds, and in particular, their longtime producing partner, Pierre Spengler. Fierce arguments broke out almost on a daily basis concerning the escalating budget and production schedule. Dick never, in the course of the picture, got a budget. He never got a schedule. He was constantly told that he was over schedule, way over budget, but nobody told him what that budget was or how much he was over that budget. And at one point, he said, why don't you just schedule the rest of the film for two days and I'll be nine months over. The relationship between Donner and the producers became so bad, they could no longer speak to each other, and director Richard Lester, who had worked with the Solkinds on The Three and Four Musketeers, was brought in as a mediator. While Lester and Donner got on much better, his presence still resulted in a lot of tension during production. Donner recalled, he'd been suing the Solkinds for his money on three and four musketeers, which he'd never gotten. He won a lot of his lawsuits, but each time he sued the Solkinds in one country, they'd move to another, from Costa Rica to Panama to Switzerland. When I was hired, Lester told me, don't do it, don't work for them. I was told not to, but I did. Now I'm telling you not to, but you'll probably do it and end up telling the next guy. Lester came in as a go-between. I didn't trust Lester, and I told him. He said, believe me, I'm only doing it because they're paying me the money that they owe me from the lawsuit. I'll never come onto your sets unless you ask me. I'll never go to your dailies. If I can help you in any way, call me. In spite of this bad blood and behind-the-scenes conflicts, Donner made sure to keep spirits high on set and ensure the cast and crew were not privy to the full extent of his difficulties with the Solkinds. He was under like, a great deal of stress, too, because um, for whatever reasons, uh, the producers uh, either wanted him to hurry up or, or do better or whatever producers want. Dick kept the problems between him and the Sulkins from us as much as possible, but we all at that point had uh, opinions, uh, prejudices. <laughs> it was a lonely period. It was a long period. It was tiring. It was exhausting. But I had taken on the 
project of making Superman, and damn it, nothing was going to stop me. Due to the spiraling budget and delays in the schedule, it was decided to stop filming on Superman 2 and ensure the first film was completed, though this meant changing the ending. Originally, the first film would end in a cliffhanger, with General Zod and his cohorts escaping the Phantom Zone. In the sequel, Zod would end up destroying the Earth, forcing Superman to turn back time in order to save humanity. But with the movie now costing so much, the film's fate at the box office was now less certain, and so Donner decided it would be unwise to end the first film with a cliffhanger if it wasn't a hit. Therefore, Superman turning back time to save the day was moved to the ending of the first film. When it came to the special and visual effects, the first hurdle to clear was making the audience believe a man could fly. Guy Hamilton had already spent $6 million on test footage before Richard Donner joined the production, and when he viewed the flying footage, none of it was usable. Donner found a lot of the tests resembled the cheap methods used in the early black and white serials. Donner wanted something much more dynamic and believable. Director of special effects Colin Chilvers tried a number of techniques to create the flying sequences, such as a mannequin dressed as Superman fired out of a cannon and a remote control flying Superman doll. In the end, a number of different methods were used. For takeoffs and landings, the actors would be mounted on wires. Christopher Reeve proved to be an invaluable asset for these sequences, as he had taken up hand gliding as a hobby. This gave him the necessary core strength to hold himself on the wires properly and control his movements with great precision. While a lot of stuntmen trained on the wires, in the end the vast majority of the wire work was done by Reeve himself. Blue screen compositing was also used. Reeve would be suspended on wires, the camera would then move towards or away from Reeve to give the illusion of movement. The final technique was the famous Zoptic process. Reeve would be suspended in front of a front projection screen and two interconnected zoom lenses, one on the camera and one on the projector, combined with interactive lighting and haze, would give the illusion of Superman actually flying through space rather than simply swinging on wires in front of a screen. The visual effects team also made extensive use of miniatures and matte paintings. The Golden Gate Bridge miniature was over 70 feet long and 20 feet tall. Many of the miniature matte painters also created full-scale paintings to extend the Fortress of Solitude sets among others. To compose the music of the film, Richard Donner initially hired Jerry Goldsmith, as the two had worked together on The Omen. When I got into this picture, I immediately called Jerry and I said, I'd love to have you do the score. He said, oh, I'd love to. So we had a date set, but as the picture prolonged itself, I lost Jerry. And I said, oh God, why? I said, I'd love to go with John Williams. I wonder if we can get him. I called John Williams, I sent him the script. He called, he said, I'd love to do it. I said, oh great, I had John Williams. But then we lost him because we went past that date. We wouldn't be able to got Jerry back. And then when we just found out we were going to go for Christmas and we were going to be that much later, I lost Jerry again. Those guys were doing pictures back to back and I got John Williams. Williams was delighted to score the movie and aimed to create a light theatrical tone in the music. The day we went into a recording studio and we ran the opening credits and as Superman came on the screen. I swear to God, if you listen carefully, it literally, the music speaks the word. I screwed up his take here because I just ran out on the floor yelling. Genius, genius, fantastic. You know, the, the orchestra applauded him and everything. But it was, I, if you listen, you can actually hear the music say the word. The film had already missed its original summer 1978 release date, and so to get the film delivered to cinemas for Christmas, Donner worked around the clock with editor Stuart Baird to finish the movie. With such an enormous amount of work still to do, shooting allegedly only finished 10 weeks before the release date, with the edit being locked only a month before release. But after a grueling production, Superman the Movie was released on the 10th of December, 1978. I'll admit there were a few problems, which, by the way, is uh, target zero, right here. Ooh. <laughs> Got it. When it comes to talking about this film, I see no reason why I should mince words here. I absolutely love Superman the movie. 
It's easily one of my favourite movies of all time, and in my opinion remains the greatest superhero movie ever made, even to this day. Not only is it one of the highest technical achievements in blockbuster filmmaking of the day, but smartly adapted and truly heartwarming in its presentation. Richard Donner's direction and Jeffrey Unsworth's cinematography is spectacular. Everything has this enormous sweeping scope to it. Krypton is spellbinding to look at, but the Smallville scenes are also gorgeous. It feels like a David Lean 70mm historical epic with its sense of grandeur and majesty. Unsworth's choice of lighting, lenses and filters also gives everything this soft, almost dreamlike look to it. It gives everything this classic 1940s Hollywood texture, but with the vibrant colours of the comic book. I think what primarily dates the movie, however, are the visual effects. Now make no mistake, the effects in this film are pretty much phenomenal. However, this did come out in the wake of Star Wars, where ILM's motion-controlled camera innovations took the miniatures, matte paintings and animation techniques of the day and elevated everything to a whole new level. Superman's effects techniques by comparison are much older and a little rougher. The movie does showcase many of these older techniques at the absolute top of their capabilities, but it does place the film firmly in the 1970s. That being said, the miniature work, matte paintings, and of course many of the flying scenes look terrific. The Golden Gate Bridge sequence especially is a big highlight. The 70-foot miniature looks fantastic on screen. The weaker miniature effects surround the Hoover Dam. Unfortunately, the original miniature effect supervisor had to leave early, and this sequence was completed by a different team, and it does show. When it comes to the flying sequences, the blue screen work is easily the weakest. In several shots, the colours on Superman's suit look either washed out, underexposed, or blown out, and the movements can feel a bit stiff as well. That being said, the wire work and front projection shots hold up extremely well. The first time Superman takes off inside the Fortress of Solitude and flies past camera looks incredible. Christopher Reeve looks so smooth and in control, and the way he banks his body when making turns really helps sell the effect. When it comes to the front projection work, I feel like the scenes in the California desert do look a little rough. The team who worked on these sequences always regretted using 35mm film for the backgrounds rather than 70mm, which would have given a sharper image. However, during Superman's first night out stopping crime and saving the day, all of the flying shots look great. I've always loved this shot of Superman flying away from the city. The way the lighting interacts with him is just perfect. And what is there to say about John Williams' music, which hasn't already been said? While there have been some decent attempts at other Superman themes over the years, nothing has ever come close to topping John Williams' main title mark for this movie. It's a spectacular piece which feels powerful, touching, and optimistic. Just what Superman needs. Beyond the main theme, however, the film's score is packed with other memorable themes and enjoyable tracks. The opening track introducing Krypton might be my personal favourite. The build-up to the first crescendo is tremendous, and whenever the Krypton motif reappears throughout the film, like in the formation of the Fortress of Solitude, it's just magical. A number of tracks are also very moving. The piece which plays during Jonathan Kent's funeral is amazing, and the love theme between Superman and Lois is almost as iconic as the main march. Although the strange poem Lois says to herself during that sequence is quite bizarre. Aside from the film's technical aspect, however, what makes Superman the movie so special is that it simply nails its main character. Although I have seen some Superman fans object to the way Lex Luthor is portrayed. Rather than a mad scientist or ruthless businessman, he feels more like a Bond villain. And while I do prefer the mad scientist take on the character myself, Gene Hackman's performance is endlessly charismatic and quite intimidating. While the Bond villain influence might seem like an odd direction to go in, he's basically the coolest Bond villain 007 never had. The portrayals of many other Superman elements were also quite different than the comic books at the time, but they were so successful it's hard to imagine them in any other way. It's easy to forget Krypton and the Fortress of Solitude taking on a crystal motif and the Superman S being a family crest were all invented for this film. But they're such great ideas and are executed so well, they've basically become the default when many people think of Superman lore. This is really the definitive origin story for the character. Despite Brando's laziness on set, the way he delivers his final words to Kal-El before sending him to Earth are really touching. 
The speech is wonderfully written and the emotion of the scene is brilliantly carried by John Williams' music. Jonathan Kent dying of a heart attack, with Clark being unable to save him despite all of his powers, makes Superman as a character feel truly relatable and human. And his first appearance saving Lois from the helicopter accident is so awe-inspiring and exciting. Easy, miss. I've got you. you you've got me! Who's got you?! I have a personal fondness for the disaster movies of this era, and so modelling Superman's action sequences after those kinds of films is something I've always felt was a very smart decision. We see ordinary people caught in the fray, pushed to the very edge of death, so when Superman finally swoops in to the rescue, it feels like a huge relief. These days online, I often see a lot of criticism thrown Superman's way, with people saying that he's too powerful and too good to properly work in a film. In response, I always use this movie as a rebuttal to those criticisms, because despite this being the first Superman movie, at the time the character was already 40 years old, and many of these criticisms are actually addressed in the film itself. The opening of the film, showing as a child reading a comic book, introduces us to a more innocent worldview, and when Superman says, I'm here to fight for truth and justice in the American way, Lois bursts out laughing which is why Christopher Reeve's performance as the character is so crucial to the film's success. Not only was he the first actor to truly distinguish Clark Kent and Superman as two completely different personalities, but it also showcases his range as an actor. The scene where he briefly switches from Clark to Superman, adjusting his posture and deepening his voice, is exceptionally well performed. It's the sincerity of the character which makes him work. The very idea of a person like Superman existing is too good to be true, and yet, here he is, walking, talking, and flying exactly how such a person would. The script and direction do a lot of the heavy lifting, but none of it would have worked without Christopher Reeve in the role. This is part of the reason why Superman turning back time at the end has never really bothered me, because the emotion of the scene is so strong. Superman pulling Lois from the wreck of her car and realising he's too late is heartbreaking. To be so grief-stricken that he's unable to let her die, to be so compassionate that he simply can't let even a single person be lost and actually have the power to put things right is something I've actually always found to be quite beautiful. And that to me is what a great Superman movie should do. It should uplift the viewer by the end. Superman the movie more than succeeds in this regard. It embodies a sense of childlike wonder which can penetrate even the most hardened cynic. It's miraculous, not just for allowing us to believe a man can fly, but more importantly, it allows us to believe in hope. Upon release, Superman the movie was a box office smash. On a budget of $55 million, it went on to gross over $300 million worldwide, and spent 13 weeks at number one at the US box office. It was the sixth highest grossing film of all time, and Warner Brothers most financially successful movie at the time. To this day, it remains the highest grossing Superman movie ever made, with an adjusted gross of $1.3 billion. The movie also received critical acclaim with praise given to the direction, cinematography, visual effects, and Christopher Reeve's performance. It went on to be nominated for three Academy Awards, although Richard Donner publicly criticised the Academy for not recognising John Barry's production design, Unsworth's cinematography, or the efforts of the visual effects team. It did, however, win big at the Hugo and Saturn Awards, where the cast and the crew that were snubbed by the Academy won their deserved recognition. Following the film's theatrical run, an extended three-hour cut of the movie was created for television in order to add more commercial breaks. In 2001, a special edition DVD restored eight minutes of footage from this version, supervised by Richard Donner, making it the spiritual director's cut. This is my preferred version of the film as well. While it adds more action, I especially love the scene where Superman speaks to Jor-El after revealing himself to the world. It's another wonderful piece of acting from Reeve, and further serves to humanise Superman as a character. And Superman's success is also partly responsible for the later Batman in 1989 and highly influential on Sam Raimi's Spider-Man. The continuity of the movie was also recently continued in comic book form with DC's new Superman 78 series. But in 1980, the film's original and highly anticipated sequel, Superman 2, would see a release. Despite the triumph of Superman's first big screen outing, it wasn't long before cracks began to show both in front and behind the camera.
Thank you for watching. If you like my videos, be sure to like, subscribe, and share, and make sure to hit the bell icon to stay up to date with all of my new uploads. If you want to help the channel grow, join my Patreon or YouTube members using the links down below. There you can see videos early as well as some exclusive content. Speaking of which, I'd like to quickly thank all of my patrons and members who are now appearing on screen. Have a good one, and as always, live long and prosper.